welcome to the Move Daily Health Podcast, where we share information to empower you to be your own health hero. Welcome back to the Move Daily Health Podcast. I'm Dane Wallace, once again here with Freya Spence, and we have special guest, Roche Chopra, on the podcast with us. Did I say that wrong? Yeah, I gotta look. How's it, how's it pronounced? <laughs> That. I was like, wait, what? Say it. Say no, I like the laughing say right it. off the bat. We got it. We got and, it. And, and, well, you have to tell, what's your name? <laughs> no, I'm tell me. the audience. Chopra. 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 So, yeah. Roche and Chopra here with us. Do it again. Roche do is, do you want to do it again? <laughs> no, this is great. I like this. <laughs> All right. So, Roche is the third member of the Move Daily health coaching team. And we brought him on today because today we are going to be discussing how to navigate health and fitness claims. So if you've been to a gym, if you've been on social media, if you've been really anywhere, you have probably been inundated with health and fitness claims, whether they're regarding your movement or your nutrition or general well-being. So today we're going to talk about how we can navigate these claims with three of us who have roughly 40 years experience within the health and fitness industry. So before we get started, I'll just remind you that you can follow us again on social media. You can subscribe and share this podcast. Uh, the Instagram handle is move underscore daily underscore EDS, and the website is movewelldaily.com. So thank you again for listening. And Freya, why don't we get started with some buzzwords? Uh, so in our attempts to help navigate health and fitness claims, is uh, we've, we're first going to quantify some of the buzzwords that you'll see, and some of them you'll be aware of, and then others you may not have thought of as buzzwords before. But um, w- one of the biggest ones to date that has gained momentum over the last decade is biohacking. And biohacking, the, the word to hack something, like that insinuates we're going to find a shortcut. Uh, it is often used as a way to suggests that we have hacked our own bodily systems, hence biohacking, in order to optimize a specific cellular pathway or what have you. And it's always with the guise of trying to um, increase performance or slow down aging. As, as we discussed in our last podcast? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Slow down aging. We're all aging. We're all aging. Right. Can't really slow down. It's going to happen. I'm okay with the aging. Is it n- not not just aging, right? It's also like biohacking. What, am I not close enough to that mic? <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Eat that mic. Wow, that, you have to be really close. Huh? Yeah. This thing didn't buy me dinner to get that close. Oh, okay. Well, we're getting started <laughs> real early okay. here. So, so biohacking in the terms of also like fat loss and things like that, correct? Yeah. Like trying to get yeah. as skinny yeah. as possible. Yeah. And yeah. again, like, look, the... The truth is either something is good for your biology or it is bad for your biology. So biohacking was something created to counterbalance you doing something or many other things really shittily to your body. And so, oh, let's hack the system that we've already brought down to try and bring it back in a way that's a shortcut or a roundabout way to do that. So to me, this is... You know, it's, it's a nice word too, right? Biohacking. It makes you feel like you're doing something great. Now, there's a biohacking conference out there now that's like $1,500 US to go listen to a bunch of people speak about a bunch of random shortcuts. It's like, guys, maybe we don't do all the crappy stuff to our bodies first, and then we don't have to go down that road to begin with. Because any shortcut is also going to have shortcomings, and it's not going to get your body and your health to where you want to get it. So anyway, that's a word I don't love. Yeah, I'm not I'm not a huge huge fan of it to be totally honest because I think at this point in time so many people aren't clear on what makes their systems thrive to begin with that they don't need to hack. Hacking usually involves a lot of supplements, which mm-hmm. is a massive money maker. <laughs> it usually involves a heavy investment of of funds. And so, yes, on the one hand, you could say like some of their bio biohacking techniques are to do cold exposure therapy. Okay, fine. That one could be free. Go jump in the lake in Canada in the winter. Correct. Um, but most of the time, it's linked to a lot of supplements. And so many people don't, you know, they don't really even know what to feed themselves or what to do day to day. Never mind adding in a ton of supplements and adding a lot of money to their budget that just isn't sustainable. Mm-hmm. You got yeah. to supplement that poor diet. 
<laughs> well, yeah. or we could fix the poor diet. <laughs> yeah. That sounds way yeah. too simple. <laughs> I know, right? Um, how many supplements does one need, Dane? Uh, I what do I take, Freya? I think I have I have magnesium um, and before bed every other night maybe, and uh, creatine in my protein shake. Mm-hmm. And yeah, there you have it. What do you take? I think I'm only with the protein as far as the supplement. Yeah, protein? everything else is yeah. non-existent mm-hmm. for me. I take I take more, but but that's that's necessary <laughs> due necessary. to the EDS. <laughs> EDS adds a layer, but I would say that I take a lot less than mm-hmm. in my twenties when I would go to appointments with various practitioners and walk out with like another yes. long list of more supplements. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I would like to find a way to make my gut work without needing to spend like eight hundred bucks a month on supplementation. Mm-hmm. And and we, you know, there there are certain supplements that we know can be extremely helpful for um, for for people, but even then, a lot of people will take supplements, and meanwhile, like they're eating a heavily processed diet. It's like, yeah, what's the point? Like yeah, it's kind of no. Yeah, we've mentioned this before, but take your supplement budget, stop taking the supplements, put it into your food budget, get better quality food. It's going to serve your health better than doing it the other way around. And again, just kind of wrap up with biohacking. If you hear the word biohacking, I mean, just go the other way. This is an extreme approach. If you can avoid extremes, you're going to avoid the extreme swings back to the other, other direction as well. So as much as it's not exciting, focusing on the basics of daily movement, get your sleep, eat whole foods. I mean, th- that's where you should put the majority of your energy. And if you do that, you're going to be a pretty healthy person. Um, while on the topic of biohacking, biofeedback is a great word that I know you love, Freya. I mean, look, like... <laughs> I know I know a lot of people uh, that I do respect who use this. I think that Agreed. we have a responsibility as professionals to reduce the number of complex words that we use or to quantify them immediately. Mm-hmm. So if you say something like biofeedback, you need to immediately follow that up with what that means. Oh, it's just bodily feedback. Like we would like you to check in with how your gut feels, check in with how your stomach feels, check in with how your shoulder feels, your hip, whatever it is for you. But it, Check in with your body. That That's feedback. It's just mm-hmm. bodily feedback. So I, th- I think our industry, unfortunately, has so many people who, who impress with uh, <laughs> fancy words. And granted, yes, I like it. I'm totally comfortable with those words, but I think that what we need to do is make people realize that health is accessible to them. They yes. are in charge. They can be in charge. And when we use complex words, it's like that conversation I cited with my nephew where you know, I explained our ocular system. He's like, I just call those my eyes. I'm like, correct. that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, biofeedback, sure. Biohacking, it's a hack. It's a shortcut. Just say what it is. If you're trying to find a shortcut. Biofeedback, it's listening to your body. So, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, some clients will totally love words like that. And then, but m- most of the time it's like, no, we're just dressing something up. Just say what it is. It creates a barrier, right? For some people, yeah. it's going to create a barrier because oh, maybe I'm not, I don't know that word. I'm not comfortable with that word. That sounds really complicated. I don't know how to do that. I've never tracked biofeedback. I don't know what to do. It's like, well, that person just had that idea and now they're never going to, you know, pursue just listening to what their body's telling them. Mm-hmm. Right? Easy, easy way to make money, right? Make something, take totally. something super simple, make it sound really complicated, mm-hmm. sell it back to the masses. So back to the masses. Yeah. yeah, but it taps into their, it taps into their complexes, right? Um, people these days generally know what mitochondrial biogenesis is, or they've at least heard the word. They're like, I've heard that's a good thing. And uh, <laughs> you looking around for mitochondria? <laughs> Where's the biogenesis? <laughs> What's happening over here? <laughs> um, but, but there are all these claims, and they tap into complexes, namely into fears that people have. Um, and, and, yeah, that kind of thing sells. Mm-hmm. And... Th- Hand in hand with that, we've got hormone balancing. Roche, how do you balance your hormones? <laughs> no, I, I, you know what? That's a good question. I don't really do too much for that. They just kind of stay sleep? in check other you than train? my good sleep. But literally, have you yeah. ever thought about how should I, no. how can I balance my hormones? That's, that's so like, taking yeah. back by this question. What? <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> and yeah, in in <laughs> fairness. Why are you looking at me so seriously? <laughs> in fairness, it's something <laughs> that is sold to women mm-hmm. yeah. more so than men. Because with men, it's just boost your test. It's not mm-hmm. balance your hormones. For women, it's more delicate. It's balance your, balance your hormones. You're going to be healthy. I have a fun <laughs> hormone story with supplements. Hormone so monster? No. Okay, just checking. Rage, rage, 
Rage. <laughs> Any Big Mouth fans out there? All right, moving along because it's okay, probably Dana not a lot. should never be allowed <laughs> to get her in a room. Why does the, the teacher usually separate? I was going to say, why am I not sitting there? <laughs> um, so I was doing, you know, skin caliper testing. So skin caliper testing, they pinch your fat, determine your overall um, fat percentage, uh, body fat percentage, I should say. <laughs> Your, yes, fat percentage, yes. your body fat percentage. Right. And, uh, and so there was a really popular system that was uh, clearly very profitable to a lot of people, sold a ton of supplements, and they used skin caliper testing to choose which supplements to quote-unquote prescribe and then uh, help people with their composition. So I did this, and I was trying this. This was a colleague who a, a bunch of us were, were going to see as he was trying this new system out, and uh, I went to pick up a few of the supplements he had recommended after that visit. One of them wasn't in. Totally forgot about it. Went on about my day. Went back to him two weeks later. He's like, oh, this particular uh, site has changed. It means that whatever supplement has worked. And in my head, I was like, do I tell him that I didn't take the supplement? Because immediately my brain was like, oh, right, that's the one I forgot. Or they didn't have it in, and then I forgot it. And then I was like, oh, this might all be bullshit. <laughs> you were home when the lights came on. Yeah, yeah. so anyway, uh, um, uh, yeah, point is, like, hormonal balancing is definitely something that has is pitched mostly to women. Testosterone is definitely something that is pitched with certain supplements. But to women, uh, the insinuation is just uh, that if they take all these magical supplements, it will balance their hormones, mm-hmm. and that's it, relatively irresponsible. Also, um, most coaches in many parts of the world are not allowed to recommend supplementation, especially right, given that we are not in the profession of, uh, we are not endocrinologists. So, yeah. Now, what does influence your hormones? Exercise? Yes. Sleep? Yes. Quality food intake? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So all of those things do influence your foods, but there's, uh, sorry, do influence your hormones, but there's no like magical food that's going to balance your hormones or magical supplement that's going to balance your hormones. That's for sure. Consistency with the basics. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can totally shift it, but, um, again, it taps into people's complexes and their fear, especially targeting women who are uh, approaching menopause Mm -hmm. because it taps into the complex of like, don't let yourself go as if menopause is letting yourself go. It's, it's, It's She's terrible. So it's like, it's yeah. awful. Yeah, so but that's mean. how they create well, it, right? And that's a good rule of thumb with any type of marketing is if the marketing is, you can just feel it's basically creating a problem. It's pinpointing a problem that like, oh, I didn't even know I had that problem. Do I, are my hormones in, the imbalanced? Is this, this is the problem I have? Wow, I really should listen. I didn't even know that. Let's tell me more about that, please. Pump the brakes, right? Like if you didn't know you had a problem, you probably don't have a problem. Like don't just buy the snake oil move forward <laughs> if you didn't have the problem in the first place that's a good yeah. way to put it and you probably don't have the problem now you're only just worried about the problem because you just so read about just, the problem yeah. it doesn't mean you have a problem there. and especially if you got that on social media or a blog somewhere yeah. you don't know who that person is you don't know they just could be just making something up it doesn't there's no credibility to a lot of the stuff out there so again this is where we go back to the biofeedback listening to your body to see if, there, if there's nothing wrong, don't look for a solution and don't be sold something just because you heard somebody else had that problem and then maybe you had like one little symptom. You're like, oh, maybe I have the whole thing. Or because you're afraid of something happening, yeah, right? Yeah, fear. Like, don't make decisions that's fear. There's so much fear and, y- you know, you guys, we've all got clients who've been sold things yeah. out of out of fear. And so it's just, it's crazy, like just, just listening to this right now. I have to get closer again? Come on. How many times? What's the over-under on me getting too far away from the mic <laughs> all the time I'm here? Here we go. <laughs> Uh, it's just, it's crazy listening to this about how much, how, like, much of a wild west it is out in the fitness industry with anything goes, really. And Mm -hmm. it's just as long as you can market yourself properly, all of a sudden it's a good thing. Or if you can make it sound smart enough, all of a sudden it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. That has to come back with, like, a a lot of us come into this industry and just get, you know, your weekend certification and then you have to roll from there. So I I think a lot of people get a lot, uh, they're trying to, I guess, not self-esteem boost, but uh, give themselves credibility is the word I'm looking for. Um, and it's, it's crazy how unregulated this is. And mm-hmm. that's, that can happen to, you can just suck people in like that. You're right, snake oil vendors. Yeah. yeah. And I think, is that a fist bump? Yeah, is that course. what that was for? That's exactly I, just, that I didn't know for. if it was there for not. I didn't want to leave you hanging. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> that video is going to look weird. We're a team. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> yes. Things got weird. It is a wild ride. <laughs> <laughs> Things got weird. It only yeah. took 10 minutes. Yeah. 
or less, I'm not sure. Um, but, but within that um, sort of Wild West and credibility, I think a lot of people fall into certain traps quite innocently because, you know, the, some of the marketing is somewhat lucrative. I know that when I switched from being in a clinical setting into like a main gym setting, um, it was very, and I think I've spoken to this before, it was a very different filter, right, in terms of like why you ha have someone coming to see you and, and what the intention is in terms of sending them on their way. And, and I know that uh, we can all speak to that where, going into sort of more mainstream gyms, a lot of it is about the fact that you have to transform. And mm. and marketing is all about this, creating some sort of alternate universe you or current universe you, but about the need to transform. And, mm -hmm. and you know, everyone's seeking a feeling, so it's very easy to, to swallow that pill and think that, yeah, that's the way in which I need to transform. And I had this conversation with a gym owner in the city when he said that they were going to, uh, like, great guy, and opening up a really, uh, like, community... Um, centered space and how he was going to follow around a few different clients as they came in um, over the course of the first like four or five months of their training to show their transformation and I said well what happens if their transformation's internal then what does that not suit your marketing narrative because I, I hate I like it not many things bother me to that degree, but that bothers me to that mm -hmm. degree. The idea that, like, your body comes in here and we must change your body. It's like, you can have an internal transformation. Your mindset can shift. You can realize how much more you're capable of, how much more competent you are. Like, holy crow, I thought I was an athletic, but look at what I just did. All of those are transformations that really change that human being's outcome and their function and their health. None of that had to do with their body changing. Yeah, sure, there might be some shifts and changes, of course. Like, they may stand up taller because, you know, they've got more range of motion, things like that. But, like, why is it their story is only a value if we made them lose X number of pounds? They have to visually look different for it to be, like, it just, mm -hmm. ugh, it's gross. Well, and that's, again, that's... <laughs> Technical term. Something you'll never see on a Move Daily website are before and after pictures of somebody topless showing how much body fat they lost. Absolutely. It's God, I love it. Again, look. <laughs> so good. <laughs> understand if you want to you want to change your body, that's that's your prerogative. That's great. I've been there. I've wanted to change my body. Like it's it's something it's a it's a goal that you're you're very well permitted to have and going from a certain body type to another body type can absolutely be health promoting. Nobody's saying that. But to have the mentality that you have to transform your body to be a better person. Or That's to, the part we have or to accomplish yeah. something worthwhile yeah. is it's just it's gross as far as I'm concerned and we've been sold it time and time again in this industry and I remember when I was you know coming up as a nutrition coach like I did I definitely got people to send me pictures of themselves before getting started and now I look back on that and I'm like so you didn't even know this person. They came to you to help. And one of the parts of the intake form was they had to send you pictures of themselves half naked. And I feel, I, I mean, it makes me feel ill inside to, to, to think about doing that to someone right now to, to remember how that must have felt to some people. And to me, it's just not fair. And it's, it puts all the emphasis on, you know, is your body changing? And if it's not, you're failing. And that is... As far as I'm concerned, irresponsible and it's gross. And that's the biggest thing I would change about the nutrition coaching industry if I could was that you take a lot, lot, a lot of emphasis off of that piece and put it more on tracking the things that mattered. Like, what are you actually doing day to day? You know, track your actual behaviors day to day. Don't just hop on the scale and take pictures of yourself. Think about how's your, like your mental well-being. Are you sleeping at night? How are your relationships? Mm -hmm. How's your relationship with yourself? Because at the end of the day... You're going to feel a lot better about your body when you feel good inside your body. So that's the biggest shift. When I see transformations, I'm just like, run the other direction, guys. It's not, even if you do manage to transform your physical body, that doesn't mean you're going to feel any better on inside. Right. Not if that it was your only filter. And you've seen that a lot, Roche. Absolutely. Of like, um, at the big box gym I used to work at, it's the same thing. Like everyone's coming in for weight loss and you were taking pictures and like, mm -hmm that was how we tracked how well you were doing. 
But now coming here and having different clients and different goals, it's like the tracking is I couldn't bend down to touch my toes because I was so scared my back would go out or I would bend down and get whatever it is off the floor because I was so scared that my back would give out. And now I could get down to the floor, play with my grandkids, get back up, and my mobility is there. And like That's the transformation you want to see is like not being able to go from, you know, do a hip hinge to being able to do a hip hinge safely with no pain. Those are the kind of transformations that I like to see now. It's the kind of change that lasts you a lifetime, literally, right? And it doesn't just make you obsessive compulsive about what you're eating every day and how you look in the mirror and what are people thinking about you. It's, it's just, wow, I'm able to do anything I want every day and I'm not in pain. And it's just really cool. It's, it's just a much better filter to have, right? I think it would also make a lot of, uh, a lot of gyms in general more approachable. Some of them are, like, I think we've mentioned we normally in normal times swim at the Y down the street and I like it there because it's like every age every demographic every body type you know they let you be silly on your membership photo at least for us they did um because it's just your face you do what you want there's 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 no forced like consult we're going to stick you on a scale and this is the way things are going to go um and and so as such, it's very welcoming. So you get that broader demographic. So maybe you get people who would be more hesitant to move moving. And and it totally changes, like we say, change your stimulus, change your life. It completely changes the way people um, live and get through their days. And, you know, we would go and swim at the time that the Aquafit class was going on. And you have people who go to those classes every single week and you hear them chatting in the class. Like, what's what's wrong with that? There's nothing. Like, that's awesome. They don't have to prove. And, again, we're not harping on people who do want to transform and, and change, like, from a physical standpoint. That's, that's fine. We're not harping on that. We're just saying that shouldn't be the standard, and unfortunately it is. Even when I was in university and really underweight I joined a gym that was up the street and I was trying to like gain weight they did the same thing brought me in said you had to do this consult I was like no I don't really want to like I'm good I've got a coach they're like no no you got to do this consult it's what we do every onboarding weighed me and even then they still like they didn't really know what to do because they're so used to telling people that they need to lose weight Mm -hmm. and (laughs) it was just like do you have a another alternate option um and so yeah i think that if we just had people you know building that confidence to get down to the ground to tie on their shoes differently to have comfort in their day to not be afraid of how they're going to feel if they walk for two hours like things like that it would it would change but it's um not a fear tactic (laughs) to sell that so i think it's harder to uh sell we would need an entire industry shift you guys, you guys have seen Dodgeball, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, the wrench. world needs more average Joe's gyms. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Coming in a pirate costume workout. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you do you. That would be great. <laughs> but it speaks to the value of community, right? Again, it's a, it's, it's a very important thing. If you feel like you're always alone and on an island, there's no transformation that's going to make you feel better about yourself. Like having that sense of community helps you shift that mental paradigm away from that oh, it's all about what I look like and how people are judging me too. Like, wow, these people in the community don't care what I look like. We're just here having a good time and it's good for us. So yeah, that's the YMCA is amazing for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, having that also creates a cyclical cycle. People are nervous, anxious about coming into those environments because they feel like they're going to be judged. And, you know, a lot of studios and gyms are, are definitely against that these days, mostly studios, like one-offs. Um, but then that perpetuates what, what personal trainers may do. So they have this person who comes in and there's been pressure put on if this person needs to lose needs to lose 40 pounds by the end of the year. And now they're training in a way that sacrifices that person's yeah. uh, joints, their, perhaps their mental, whatever it is, mm-hmm. they're training in that sort of hard ass way because there's this weird thing of like, well, if you don't get the client that result, they're not going to respect you, come back to you. And then the other pressure of just like, you know that that's perhaps really unrealistic for someone and that's not what they're there for, but there's just this, uh, it's a negative cycle there by, uh, whereby the, c- the ch- personal trainer then trains in a way that's that sort of hard-ass 
style that we spoke about. Absolutely. Uh, they also have to eat. So they're like, oh, I need that client no matter what. So I'll do whatever it takes to get you to your goals. Yeah. Like, yeah. Those goals are unrealistic. Unreal- You'd be better off making sure they, they know what they should be doing and they'll come back all after time after time after time if you take care of them properly instead of risk yeah. injury and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. Training that way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we uh, why don't we why don't we shift gears a little bit? Go to a little bit of nutrition talk. Yeah. Um, let's start with just one awesome buzzword that is just the best, which is superfood, which is <laughs> advertised on all sorts of which I find hilarious. All sorts of bagged and boxed products, yeah. which is this contains superfood, and it's like it's also laced with processed sugar. So superfoods is just a term that is marketed at us and. Freya, if I told you what an actual superfood is, how would you describe that? A uh, superfood is anything that grows in the ground, on the ground, from a tree, from a bush, that you could find before the Industrial Revolution <laughs> created yeah. processed foods. That's a superfood. Yeah, exactly. I would say anything that was once alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really. It's like a whole food, a one-ingredient food, a, a food that has an appropriate amount of nutrients for how it was you know, created within this universe of ours. Basically, if it was made in a factory, it's not a superfood. It is a processed food that is not super. So (laughs) superfoods, again, it's just, it's a buzzy, buzzy word. And they're like, oh, you know, you're, what are they? I don't even know how to say it. Acai berries, acai, acai berries. I don't even know how to do it. You're close. Yeah, close. I I think people understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, there's even like, avocado i'm like yeah avocado is a superfood it's great food but like you don't have to put on this pedestal you're gonna be fine if you don't eat it like it's so superfoods are one of those things that yeah don't buy into the buzzwords you don't have to have them focus in on whole foods one ingredient foods if they were an animal once or a plant once probably pretty nutritious full of good stuff for you and that's really all you need to know about superfoods just laughing at the it was an animal once and it's still an animal even though it's dead <laughs> <laughs> It's what remains. It's what remains. What did it change it to? <laughs> yeah, we, and alive once means a plant. Alive once. Yeah. Okay. Plants, of course. Yes. Because plants are living. We got some cucumbers growing over here in the corner, and they're like, they got these little tendrils, and they like expand and grab onto things. It's like, it's like they get me in my sleep. It's got a far reach. Sure. I had nightmares last night. I'm sure you did. I'm so, sure you did. on the nutrition front, one of the things that we see sold to people all the time are meal plans and macro diets, macro tracking. What I say to people, and people come to me for this, and my response to people on that is that if that's something they want, that is not something they should pay for because you can go on the internet and you can find meal plan after meal plan after meal plan. You can find macronutrient calculators. All the information is there, and you can customize it for yourself just as well as any coach. All the information is there. It's not a special thing. They're not going to do you any good. I, again, early days, made macro plans, meal plans for people. Absolutely did. Did they last and sustain forever? Of course not. As soon as you get off a meal plan and go back to doing whatever you want, whatever results you got are gone out the door. So meal plans and macro diets are temporary quick fixes. They're not something you should be paying a coach for. Um, and if, again, you can, you can do your education on the internet and do that, get an app. There's tons of apps out there for it as well. But again, if you want to overhaul how you actually, you know, interact with food, your relationship with food, then that's a more complex process in which you would reach out to an expert nutritionist or nutrition coach. Cool. Awesome. Thoughts? Like Anything that. else? That's my, that's my take on the meal plan and macro diet. And what's, the, what's the simplest thing you give to someone? Like I, w- they're, they're asking about, like, what should I be eating? And it, I generally go back to, the, like, the plate. I mm-hmm. say half your plate should be like greens and vegetables and stuff like that. And then half of the other half should be protein. Half of the other half should be your carbohydrates and there's some fats in there. There's a lot of halves on that plate. It's not going to tell you. Lots of halves. Lots of halves. Halves of halves. But yeah, no, halves again, ge- general rules are, are, are great. Like if you, mm-hmm. if you take a dinner plate and you say half of that plate is going to be vegetables. Mm, delicious. That's a great place to start for nearly anyone. If a quarter of that plate is then a protein source or even a third of that plate is protein source... That's amazing. Protein's very important. If that's a animal source or plant source, whatever, make it a protein source. And then the rest of that pie can be a starchy carbohydrate source, for example. Mm-hmm. And that is a really nice way to just kind of look at a plate and say portion size wise, if you are looking to eat well, quote unquote well, 
that is a way you can do it for sure. But always addressing what does the human body need to be healthy? For most people, we need high quality protein and we need fiber, micronutrients, and phytonutrients, all the stuff you're going to get from plants. So I don't know, there's the omnivorous diet for me is a really good generalization as a diet. Um, but then it's very, you have to individualize it for, for the person. Yeah. Yep. And then there's fad diets, guys. God, there's a lot of fad diets. Yeah. Have you, have you tried any fad diets? Oh my God. Which ones all haven't I done? Yeah. Tell, tell us all about what fad diets have you tried, Roche? Uh, okay. So we had no nutrition coaching coming up, right? It was kind of like, oh, yeah. I, I, I was gen pop back then, uh, when it comes to this stuff. So what have I done? I did the, when CrossFit was big, what was the, what was that one? Paleo? The caveman? Zone. Paleo, paleo. There was, was zone and then there was paleo. Yeah. yeah. So paleo was like a big thing. I was paleo man back in the day. Um, and then I did, uh, that carnivore one where I didn't eat anything but meat oh, for a little God. while. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to ask you, how did that go? How long were you on it? How did you feel? I don't think I lasted more than two weeks. Why? Uh, I don't remember. It was just, I don't think it made my gut feel pretty I was gonna good. I was going to say, were you pooping? I, I was about to say, I don't, don't think I smelled very good. Yeah. Was, no, that's actually, a, that is actually a common thing that people who go on the carnivore diet say. Yeah. Is that their body odor changes and it's usually not good it wasn't pleasant um yeah. i'm not single back then so you know you had, you had to smell pleasant um doesn't mean i don't, <laughs> so you don't now. need to now <laughs> but, <laughs> look I guys i can just he smells I fine you. you said you said you'd already made the mistake i knew it i could outdo you don't worry <laughs> there you go uh and then uh i've tried the keto as well um that didn't go over well the the oh the best thing like we just talked about was generalizations that's stuck for the longest is looking at your plate. Oh, there's two vegetables. Here you go. There's mm -hmm. another, there's a meat source or whatever. Yeah. And that's stuck for that. the longest. And that's always made you feel or me feel the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's um, like, there's still a lot of research going on around certain types of intakes like keto. And um, so I've used keto for like two to three weeks at, the, at a time in the past uh, in particular at, at different points within the sort of endurance racing season because endurance athletes in particular get a lot of oxidative stress in the gut as a consequence of their training. So put very simply, they get gut troubles um, because of the training stress load, total load. So for me, keto, um, using a keto protocol for a couple of weeks or, or three weeks was helpful in terms of bringing down like total inflammation from the training and carbohydrate load that needed to go along with that, then picking it back up. Because the other thing I learned ages ago is removing carbs, thanks to paleo, like years ago, uh, really negatively impacted hormones and then made me, somebody with mass cell activation syndrome and EDS, intolerant to even more food. So that created its own secondary issue. So removing certain things for a really long time when you're not actually allergic to them just because they follow some sort of um, rule book that said this is the way to do things is not actually helpful. And some of the research that we saw presented just a few months ago on keto actually showed that you know, yes, you could say the the keto athletes were sparing glucose, but actually resulted one of them, and they were using cyclists, um, they just became less good at utilizing glucose. That's not what I want. I mean, I want to be able to use all fuel sources, especially in a long haul race or a long day or whatever. And so the fact is they become they became worse, simply put, they became worse at utilizing carbohydrates, even if there were carbohydrates present, because they had done so much long-term training with no carbs. So now when given carbs, which is a great fast energy source while you're, you know, training or recovering from it, their bodies were not good at processing it. And ultimately, the second study that was the longer one of the two, uh, we'll, we'll find them and link them in, uh, showed that they had reduced performance. Because, yeah, sure, you could say, oh, they're better at fat burning, but because they became worse at carbohydrate utilization, all that training that they had in the camps didn't show off with faster time trials or faster race times, which, you know especially for somebody who's competitive, that kind of defeats the purpose. So yes, it can bring down inflammation um, potentially because maybe you just had 
too much other stuff. It forces you to go in into a simpler intake. I think that's why people find it beneficial when they first start. But even then, it's just not one of those things that's great long term. And um, it, it, you know, context hasn't been applied, and then you see people again are using transformation as the rationale to partake in these diets. Like, speak to them in a year from now and see how they actually feel. If their blood markers are worse, their performance, whatever it is for them, like within their life is low, lower. Their energy is lower. They've now developed food intolerances. Like, there's a problem yep. here, and you need to now work really hard to reverse that um, because our gut microbiome we know now needs variety we cannot subsist on on very um limited types of food sources and some of us may have that as a concept consequence of allergies but i can attest to the fact that trying to introduce more and create tolerance is a lot of work and it took years to reintroduce things um, now with that said, the blood type diet is another diet. I never did that. I studied it. <laughs> I chose to study it. We all had to study uh, a diet of our choice is back in uh, university and the blood type diet is based on nothing. It's a great example of someone who just, you know, we all have blood types. Mm -hmm. That's information most people know. So like, cool. I know my blood type. Some people do, some people don't. And the idea of it is so great, right? The idea that you could just take a blood sample, figure out what type you are, and then have, like, a script for what you need to feed yourself for the rest of the life? How amazing would that be? That's so simple. But it was, like, completely false, like, not based on any sort of sound research or science. But it sold a lot because, again, the, the promise of it is so great, and people want that simple fix. Yeah. And I don't blame them for it. Um, so hopefully people aren't still following that. But there yeah. are thousands of diet books Thousands. Oh, thousands. And it's like... What did you, what did you like read were, about I today? I feel like there were like fitness um, uh, programs being made on blood type too. You could yes. like... Yeah. Roche, what was the diet you read about today? I read about diet today. Body type? Oh, yeah. Oh, it I was um, somatotype. Uh, nutrition for somatotypes. So like you eat a certain way if you're an endomorph, ectomorph, mesomorph. It was dispelling this myth is the one I was saying. You don't... They were saying you don't do... Eat for that. Eat for the way you want to train, not for the body type. Okay, you're, you have. But again, it just goes to show you there's so many yeah, different, so many different types. different types, like alkaline diet. Like there's there's yeah. so many, and if you look at the research, what you'll find is that it's not like go on any diet you want. If it's successful, it's successful because you've become more mindful about the choices that you're making. It's not necessarily about the rules that you're following. It's that you're actually giving some conscious thought now to what you are putting in your body. So you're going to see some improvements there. And I think you sent me an excerpt from a book earlier today, Freya, and they've been mentioned there. When you do it, when people go on diets, they tend to increase their physical activity as well. So that's another big driver for you know health benefits or weight loss. Well, we know that if people don't move and they eat an otherwise good diet, they are not as healthy as someone oh. who does move. They don't utilize oh. the food in the same way. So you could take two people, imagine they were clones, and feed them the same thing. One of them is allowed to move, one of them is not. You're going to have two human bodies that utilize the substrates from those foods in very different ways. So movement is one of the things, and I wish I could remember the researcher's name that we saw presenting some of this uh, in December. Mm find it mm -hmm. um but movement's the catalyst for how you use your food and mm -hmm. that's where you know i remember in university there were uh, some of my roommates were worried about the freshman 15 and so they were going on diets which is unfortunate um and they were saying we're just going to focus on nutrition right now and on diet then we're going to add in movement later and it's like you you it's can't not how it works. actually like you, you're better off just just start moving just move, do things that you love and see what happens, see what shakes out. Like don't put yourself on a strict diet, um, please, because just moving intentionally changes how you use your food. It changes, we mentioned it before, muscles and endocrine organ. So it signals to the rest of your body in terms of how to function, what to burn, when to burn, so on. So um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the diets are, um, they're really rigid. And I told this to a, a client, Yesterday, I said, uh, you know, if we were meant to eat, like, one very strict way of, of feeding ourselves, then we would be specimens in a lab. We wouldn't be organisms living out in mm -hmm. our environments. Like, you just can't. Mm -hmm. 
And no one likes that answer. Not no one. A lot of people don't like that answer um, because having a strict answer there would be would make it easier because then they have rules to follow. And you know, like you said, there are guidelines to follow. Like mm -hmm. eat real food, as eat hi as high quality as possible, so that there's less like pesticide load, less processing. You don't have question marks about what's even in it. Um, and then make sure you hit your protein and you have as much variability as possible. What was the food count that was suggested at one point? Like, see how many different types of foods you can consume in a week. The challenge, I believe, was 50. 50, which is a lot. But hey, even if you could hit like 30, that would be amazing. And all of this supports a healthy gut biome, which then dictates so many other things, including your brain function, your energy, your sleep quality, your cognitive abilities, and then, of course, any physical endeavor that you undertake. Yeah, I think most people would be very surprised if they counted how many <clears throat> how many types of food they ate on a weekly basis. I think they'd be very surprised at how short that list was. Um, like I said, the goal, I forget the researcher now, but the challenge was eat 50, a variety of foods, 50 different foods in a total week, which for some people might not seem like a lot, but it's, it's a lot. And it yeah. would be pretty hard for yeah. a lot yeah. of people. And especially taking into consideration if you're eating packaged processed foods you don't get to count like the cookies and the bread differently because they're the same ingredients they're just packaged in a different way so that's not diversifying your gut bacteria they're feeding on the same things the goal here is to eat a wide variety of foods to feed different gut bugs that again are going to change how you think how you feel how you act because as much as we want to think we're totally in charge, it's actually the little microbes that are in our inner tube that uh, dictate how we behave. So, <laughs> which is crazy, but here we are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're just a sequence of tubes. Uh, Professor Andrew Huberman, who has the Huberman podcast, mm -hmm. he referenced us. We are a sequence of tubes. I know that. And I've always used the analogy of like um, those those toys that we had in, as like '80s kids that uh, were like one tube, but you could like flip the tube inside out, yep. end over end, oh, yeah. um, which gets a lot of blank stares. I hope you know what that is. It's filled with water. It's just like <laughs> yeah. a little inside or gel balloon. or something, oh, right? It was great. But he compared us to a bunch of churros, which I also thought was pretty great because <laughs> that's also kind of what our body is. We're just a whole bunch of churros, a bunch of tubes with uh, various things just well, to make sure now that I'm the hungry. stuff doesn't just come out. Uh, <laughs> But I think, you know, we touched on supplements, and one last thing about supplements is that, uh, like, again, we're not against them. They have a time and a place, and they can be very helpful, and they've been very helpful to my health. Um, but again, like, the, the goal is to get as few as possible, get the key necessary ones. And one of the things is that anyone who is sponsored by a supplement company can no longer be unbiased. And that just needs to be put out there because if they're being sponsored by any company and we've seen coaches post like 30 supplements that they take every day and it's just not necessary like are you I had I had a, a roommate at one point who had more supplements than he had food in the house like that was he just had it was not Dane is, does that count as your 50 food sources right there 50 food sources supplements wait hold on I'm close to the mic now yeah. <laughs> well, I got yeah. 20 foods and 30 supplements. So yeah. 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 There you go. But, but again, it's just one of those things where I think that we're not against them. It's just you have to know the context. You have to also make sure that your basics are covered. And if somebody is sponsored by a product, they just can't be unbiased. Straight up. It's just not possible. Yeah. And again, that's I'm why not we're not paid by any external companies. <laughs> and I'm also going to say that. That, that if you see somebody online who is pitching a lot of supplements, again, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it's like that doesn't mean that they're like a bad person or they're trying to like pitch you something bad. It's that honestly, I feel like they probably don't even know better. They probably think it's part of, you know, they're just going to make a little extra money on the side. Supplements can't be bad for you. They're probably just fine. And it, they're just doing what they need to do to get by and mm -hmm. to like make their ends meet and that kind of thing. So it's, I don't, again, don't think these people are like necessarily bad people, but understand that it, that's not some, that's not a place you want to go. You don't want to be a person who has all the supplements. It's a slippery slope and focus more on your foods. Diversifying your foods is, is a much healthier, healthier option. Um, <clears throat> I think we've done a lot on nutrition here. So just a, a few quick hits here and then let's move on to movement. The last thing I really wanted to touch on is vilifying foods, period, hard stop. Yeah. <clears throat> and yeah. 
it doesn't really matter what it is. I mean, things that I've heard are like you can't fry eggs because it oxidizes the cholesterol or like you can't eat eggs because of cholesterol or like you can't eat too many eggs or I mean eggs there's a lot with eggs um, which is really funny I mean it's just they're probably the best food in the world in terms of nutrient intake I mean they're they're, if you can tolerate them they are an incredibly nutritious there you go (laughs) if you can tolerate (laughs) if you can tolerate them because can't tolerate them I tolerate them well. I have four every day. They are nutritious. And again, if you're worried about oxidizing things by frying them, good rule of thumb for cooking anything is cook on low heat. Don't char your meats. Don't smoke your oils. Don't burn things. If you do that, you're going to avoid carcinogens, period, hard stop. So slow cooking and low cooking is the way to make things safe if you're worried about any of those weird things. Um, other things I've heard is like, don't drink cold water because it's bad for you. How about this? Drink any water at any temperature because you need water. I think that's a really good overriding <laughs> rule of thumb there. Just get the um, water into you. And stuff like meat, yeah. meat is inflammatory. And I'm like, okay. I mean, like a lot of things are inflammatory. And also what are you comparing it to? Like relative to what? And how does all meat fit in under one umbrella? It's just generalizations like that are not helpful and they're dangerous. And especially if you're saying something like meat, which can be sourced very, very ethically and can be extremely nutritious. If you're saying trying to badmouth that, but you'll eat processed food laden with sugar, it's like if you want to compare in inflammatory markers, I mean, you're going to lose that battle. So it's, it's again, a context of everything is very important and overgeneralizations are going to keep people away from really healthy foods and drive them to ones that are more processed, even if they have superfood on the label. So just heart just, health check. Just be aware. Oh yeah, the heart health check, which companies can pay for. So <laughs> heads up on that one too. <laughs> System's just rigged against yeah, us. Yeah, again, the food. <laughs> everything's rigged. Everything is run. Yeah. Again, it's... <laughs> You call them conspiracy theories you want, or just living in reality, but like big corporation and big government run everything. It, it, it just it is true. So you have to think critically for yourself. Well, it's why it's harder and harder for people to achieve any sense of health because they're pressed for time. They're living in an environment that requires shortcuts, and mm-hmm. it, and then we have a ton of processed foods pushed into our faces, and yep. people are exposed to thousands of images every single day that promote certain things as being healthy and it becomes very very hard unless somebody has a background educationally in this kind of thing to really decipher what's what but um we try our best to (laughs) simplify it if we can and to just always remind people to have a critical eye especially when you're on social media yeah well social media yeah it's just its own its own beast. Beast. <laughs> can't, of can't get into that one too much. There's, there's a, there's a, do, a, a two parter podcast coming on social media. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Uh-huh. So, why don't we segue there into some movement? I know we touched base on a few of these earlier, um, but I know you worked for the big box gym there for a while, Roche. And I think you kind of mentioned like you saw a bit of hard ass training and that kind of thing where you weren't really, not necessarily you, but other trainers who work in big box gyms, um, they might not necessarily be giving their clients tools, just kind of being a drill sergeant. Counting the reps? Uh, yeah, and a lot of people do what worked for them, and that's obviously not necessarily going to work for everybody. Mm-hmm. So it was like, oh, I back squat, and it works for me. Here's a barbell. <laughs> like, I, no need to, to give someone that if they don't need it. Um, things like that, or, you know, I love hit training, so you're going to love hit training. We're going to mm-hmm. sweat until you die, basically. Um, Gold star for puking, right? I know, right? Like- yeah. And, I mean, come on, I, I, I was guilty of that when I started as well, but you learn to get out of, uh, out of that mentality. You start to you know, train people for what they should be training for instead. But that's the stuff that I saw, the, the worst, some of the worst stuff. But also feeding into, I think we started talking about it at the beginning, of like goals that were just unreachable and unattainable. Mm-hmm. But we're going to pump the tires on these goals anyway. Like, you're going to get a six-pack no matter what we do. Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, <laughs> so, <laughs> that's not the healthiest choice for this person. <laughs> So if I was a trainer, or so not a trainer, if I was somebody who walked into a gym and I was looking for a trainer, and what are some red flags that you would say if I was trying to walk in and, like, my goal is to, like, I want to feel better in my body? Like, are there any red flags you could give out for the clients out there? Uh, a, a yes man or a yes person. <laughs> yes person. Yeah, a yes person. Someone who's just going to say yes to everything you say. I'm like, yeah, you can do this. Yeah, you can do it. Like, it's good to have that kind of enthusiasm and 
that kind of positivity. Mm-hmm. But you, as a trainer, you really have to um, be realistic about things. And if, and if that's not going to help that person, you have to be the one to be like, mm, that's that's not going to be good. Yeah, and I think you just mentioned one of them too is, you know, you go into a gym and you're given a trainer. A lot of times you don't get to pick who the trainer is, right? A big box gym will just assign you a trainer mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. maybe you get the trainer who's the power lifter. And then you don't know what, you've never lifted with a barbell before, but suddenly everything's a barbell, right? Yeah. <laughs> should we, like, we should institute a three-month probation period with each trainer. It's like, uh, you know what, after three months, I still want to train. But I don't, well, maybe we'll switch trainers to this person. And then we'll have like a rotation until yeah. you find the person that you want, not the yeah. person you get, yeah. you click, click best with. Well, and that's one of the things that people are often surprised by when they work with us is that we don't, uh, yeah, when people reach out, they're shocked that we don't not always shocked because it depends on whether they came through like a rehab referral or or not but um they they're often surprised that we don't immediately say like here are our packages um and in fact in some cases in a lot of cases when i'm working with hypermobile clients uh i say okay we're going to work on this you're going to keep me in the loop on how it's going and you're going to you're going to work on this for three to four weeks and then we'll reconvene they're a little bit surprised by that. And, and granted, some people need and want and benefit from more frequent touches. But there are certain certain bodies that I have learned uh, work better with those, like allowing them to layer in. Because like a hypermobile body takes longer to adapt, right? Mm-hmm. So I want them to so, sort of spend the first four days layering in those two. And then the next four layering in those two. By the end of it, we're, we're looking at like, you know, three weeks from now, we can learn more techniques. And that's in an effort to, it also depends on the state of conditioning of the person, but that's in an effort to not overwhelm the system. So I think sometimes people are a little bit surprised that we don't have a very clear cut, like recipe of you're going to come in and sign up with us for a year, because we're also just like, we don't know if you're going to like us that much. (laughs) And it's not that we have doubt about our abilities. It's that, like, the the way people connect is, especially when it comes to health, matters of health, is so important. And we need to respect that. And, and yes, uh, there are people that I know I probably could, could have helped as far as, like, having the knowledge to help them. But if they don't have, like, if we don't have a great sort of, personality match or style match they want someone who's a little bit more drilly i don't i don't know um then we also have to know how to how to call that and refer out and you know there's no harm in that i think that having spent as much time in the industry as i have i can recognize more readily who is a good fit for me or who might not be um who might benefit from a a different approach a different personality yeah Mm -hmm. um and staying in the movement thread of things i know there's a, a few i don't know training types that are are really interesting anyway one thing i know that um really whatever i'm just gonna call it out <laughs> neck training training your <laughs> neck so if you see these things where they're wearing the little helmet and they're like jerking their head back and forth to quote unquote strengthen their neck Frey, you want to take this one yeah i'll take this one um <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of red flags. Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I touched on this on an earlier podcast that so many people don't treat their necks well to begin with because they read their phones in bed, in lying down positions, they're on their phones as they go for a run, they're on their phones when they're walking, like they're constantly on their phones. And that just puts your neck and your shoulders in a really crummy position. So why would you then load it up with some device called the Iron neck. The iron neck. (laughs) And then just crank away. Like, it doesn't make sense. And yes, our necks need to be strong. So that's one thing that not everyone realizes. They'll get a massage. They want to get tension out, tension out, tension out. When really, the neck is probably building up a lot of tension because it's not stabilizing well. So it's now becoming a little bit more rigid or a lot more rigid. If you don't breathe well, if you, to put it very simply, if you spend more of your days and nights mouth breathing you are typically using more accessory breathing tissues those are in your neck and then consequently they impact your jaw because they go like this hand in hand so if we look at all the habits that we're doing every single day that are not helpful for the neck they're not treating the neck the way it should be functioning day to day and then we add load to it and start cranking away like it just it's very bizarre 
and we spend money on devices like this. Another interesting one is um, there's the neck traction device, which is so alarming to me because I have cranial cervical instability and atlantoaxial instability and it, I do not want anyone to touch my neck or traction it like that is well actually I let two practitioners touch my neck different but no one should be pulling on my cranium and and creating space in those joints they already have too much and so anyone who's hypermobile shouldn't be doing that you'll feel relief at first like oh I'm so lightheaded and then it's like oh no I'm so lightheaded <laughs> um, and, and so that that initial relief can then create sort of an addictive property and we had people at the gym years ago who would like hook bands at the base of their skull and like try to traction it was just uh, bad news. And then there's another one that is <laughs> bad news. And there's another one. There's always another one. <laughs> that is a dome like this. And if you're listening, just imagine like a, a half moon on the ground with obviously the flat part of the half moon on the ground and then doming up. And in that one, you're supposed to lie back on it, which puts your neck into extension. So you think chin up position. Stretches out all of the muscles on the front side of the neck which again, initially feels good because those muscles get tight. Like I said, if you don't have great breathing mechanics, all of those tissues will get tight. So then putting yourself into this position and stretching back, people will think, oh, this is great. It's bringing about a whole lot of relief. The truth of the matter is we also, we again have to go back to why those tissues are holding so much bloody tension. And it's because we're pulling our heads forward. We're looking down constantly. That is extension. That's not flexion. Most people are sitting with their heads forward and down. That's extension of the neck. So then why would we then I exaggerate that by putting it on this device to drill more extension? We need to learn how to put our head on the top of our column again. So your neck goes right up, supporting your skull, and it should be nicely balanced there so that it can pivot fully, it can shake its head, yes and no. But truthfully, we're in a position where a lot of people are now in degrees, varying degrees of neck extension, which is forward head carriage, meaning the head is slowly drifting further and further forward from the rest of the column instead of being this thing that's balanced perfectly on top with 50% behind, 50% in front. And all of these devices are tapping into the fact that most of much of our society experiences neck pain at some point in time at the same rate or similar rate, unfortunately now, to low back pain, which is upwards of 80%. And you see it in young kids too. So all of these devices are tapping into you know, a concern, a fear people have because they've experienced discomfort there. They've experienced pain there. They know that looking down and forward all the time is not great for you. And so then they buy into these things, but these things are just perpetuating the issue that we already have. If your neck is tight, breathing mechanics and head positioning are off, if it's chronically tight. Or maybe you have excess mobility like I do, and so your neck has to work over time to stabilize. There are also positive things you can do for that, but I swear using an iron neck is not one of them. <laughs> Um, and then the same thing with the neck extension, the neck traction, you're just like, it's, it's sim brief symptom relief, just like picking a scab, but then it brings back the same issue. So the best way you can resolve your neck, apart from like not walking with your phone or staring down at it is close your mouth anytime you're not speaking. I just keep it close. I'm not, like, I know I'm kind of laughing, but it's true. <laughs> if you're stressed, check in. You're probably opening your mouth just a little bit and starting to breathe through your mouth. So close your mouth. That alone will help. Stop looking down and forward at screens in uh, really unideal positions because it's the cumulative effect. It's not like looking down is going to hurt you and, oh, you're in trouble now. It's the fact that we're spending all of our time there and more and more of our time there hooked into these phones whereby we disappear out of our body and we're just in this rectangle. So, yeah, none of those neck devices are, they're all just BS. <laughs> womp womp. Sorry, I'm just... It's just, true. They're money they grab. Are. And again, a lot of the equipment, if it's fancy equipment, you're, I mean, you're being sold something. Like in, in the fitness industry, it's, there's a lot of stuff out there. I mean, that shake weight was great. But, I mean, not everything can be a shake weight. Well, not everything can. One thing, one thing I always ask people, though, before they buy devices like that is what is your understanding of that body part? 
Yep. So if they buy a back thing or a knee thing, I always ask, what is your understanding of that body part? Because I want to know if you know how that joint's supposed to function. It's not a test. Mm -hmm. I need to know, what do you know about that body part? Do you know what the neck is supposed to do? And it's important to know what the neck is supposed to be able to do before you start interjecting with all of these things. It's the same as supplements, right? What do you know of your current diet? Like, what do you know about it in terms of what you're currently taking in? And diet, I don't mean restriction. I just mean, like, literally what you put in your mouth. What do you know about it? Okay, well, then why do you think you need the supplement? So when it comes to all of those fancy tools, it's like, do you know how to use that joint the way it was built? Is it working that way? And then why do we think that this particular device is going to help it? Yeah, it's a great question. <clears throat> and I think... Roche has something to say. I'm sorry. You've been talking about neck stuff for like a little while, and I can't get this image out of my head of those like African tribes with the neck, like the rings. I was fascinated and with those. how we yeah. could probably market that and like make millions as like a traditional oh, yeah, neck of course. healing device. Yeah. I'm surprised that doesn't already exist. It's such a horrible Westerner. I just gave someone an idea out there. Oh, please don't do that, Westerners. <laughs> yeah. We have, no, please don't. We've ruined enough. White Westerners We've in particular, enough. please don't do that. We're done. <laughs> I used to look at those because we, we had subscriptions to National Geographic as a kid. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, I loved, love National Geographic. Um, and, and those, I was fascinated by them. Mm -hmm. Mostly because I was like, how do they get them around the head? Yeah. How do they sleep? Like I had a lot of questions as a, as a kid. <laughs> what happens to the neck musculature? Does it just, because they're doing it early enough that you're still very malleable at that age, right? Correct. So, you know, um, yeah. It's anyway, a for life thing. It, it would well, ob obviously, <laughs> yes, Dane. Thank you. Yeah. Anyway. Okay, tangent over. <laughs> tangent over. Continuing on to wrap. But those would be better than a freaking yes, iron neck. they would. They would give stability. It would be great. Um, but anyways, to wrap this up, I think, <laughs> other things that we need to be aware of within the health and fitness industry that we see is anytime anyone says everyone needs to do X, Y, Z, or everyone should do X, Y, Z. So some very common things that we hear are low back squatting or just back squatting in general, everyone needs to do that. FYI to people out there, you can get very strong legs without back squatting. A million other things you can do and achieve any other goal as well without back squatting. It's not a panacea and people get really tied to it. And it. speaking of necks, can, uh, can help contribute to neck pain. Um, what other ones do we got here? Ooh, ice baths, Wim Hof breathing, things that are great for everyone that are not great for everyone. Yeah, uh, with, thing is, I really like that breathing has come to the forefront in terms of people paying attention yes. to it, because I think that people have, uh, for too long, not recognized that they can actually consciously manipulate that. I mean, your diaphragm is one that you can train like any other muscle, so you can then contribute to your entire physiological state, like heart rate, uh, blood pressure, based on how you manipulate your breathing. And that obviously also will impact your, your brain. Um, and so I like that it's at the forefront. I will say that there are a lot of people who um, just forget context when it comes to different breathing techniques. Like it, holotropic breathing is not for everyone. If someone doesn't even know how to comfortably breathe through their nose for most of their day, unless they're speaking, they do not need to go and learn these types of uh, these breathing techniques and I, I think again it would help if you know we just educate on on like w what the principles are mm -hmm. like why you feel more alert after doing Wim Hof it's because you jacked up your adrenaline mm -hmm. it that's how that technique works he's not the first one to have done it um why do you feel like you can tolerate the ice baths after See answer one, you jacked up your adrenaline. Who should not do this? People who run with higher adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Naturally, <laughs> People yeah. are in a very stressed state, unless you would like to feel like you just got a slap on the face. Uh, if you have postural orthostatic tachycardia, maybe don't do Wim Hof techniques. It is not going to help you. Pos POTS is Pots. the short form for that. Um, it is not going to help you. It's going to play around with your heart rate even more because the, the fast hyperventilation breathing jacks up your heart rate. And then if your body's already not regulating pressure super well, then you go into the breath hold or into the ice bath, you can pass out. 
because uh, your blood pressure will drop too quickly. So, you know, there, there has to be context to it. So when people say everyone should do this, um, there, you know, should everyone have a degree of control over their breathing and should everyone see how much they could like see that they could leverage it, meaning reduce their stress, achieve a calmer state if they need to. We know that prior to competitions or lifts, it helps you yes. to like breathe a little faster. You want your heart rate up. Yes. Um, that's very helpful. But if I'm in the first like, you know, 20K of a bike ride, I don't need to jack my heart rate up. I need to slowly let it come up. And so then I'll, I'll work on slower breathing and nasal breathing. So anyway, um, Wim Hof has received a lot of critical acclaim and, and kudos to him for sure. I, I also know the people who've been trained directly by him apply it very differently than mm-hmm. the people who've just, you know, watched a YouTube and decided to uh, do the technique and then sit in a nice bathtub for 10 minutes that's not how he teaches it but more importantly you have to be really careful with those sorts of techniques and very careful with breath holding if you're a person who's been um, through any sort of uh, large physical or mental trauma you shouldn't be breath holding like just no it's not a good idea for you but you have to have that that filter in that context so it's it's not about the we're not opposed to the technique we're opposed to the statement of everyone needs to do this because mm-hmm. it positively impacted me. And that's just yeah. uh, not the case. And that goes for any type of, of breathing. And I like. think a good general rule of thumb is, you know, if you're thinking about starting an advanced technique, have you first mastered the basic technique? With someone, well said. Yeah. a coach. Well said, <laughs> yeah. Because a lot of people just jump into the thing that looks the most exciting, right? Being in the strongman industry, I know, like, I've had people be like, hey, I want to compete in strongman. Also, I've never lifted before. It's like, cool, we might have some work to do before we jump to the implements because, yeah, there's some stuff to cover if you, you know, don't want to die. <laughs> yeah, it's a totally fine goal as long as they've got the, like, the mindset of, you know, that Five years down the road. As the, yeah, exactly, and it takes time, and, and that may change mm-hmm. as they are exposed to it. They may decide that it's just backbreaking and they like three out of the 12 possible events and so they actually just want to integrate those into their training so yeah it's just that like any statement that that either vilifies something completely or mm-hmm. is a, a black and white like everyone needs to do this one exercise mm-hmm. no yeah everyone needs their shoulders jammed down and that's back. actually a good one you'd why don't you well, bring that one yeah up, bring that up right now it's a, this is a you great have one, to guys. stand straight like a runway model at all times yeah um, that's a that's a tough one, and then like if in every single exercise you have to jam your shoulders back. Like uh, that's a that's one people get uh, trapped into real early on. I know I fell into that trap before you realize. Oh, it gets to move in all these different places, and Correct. you're going to live in different I, places. You just need to be able to get into these ranges and fo- uh, function in these ranges. Yeah, uh, you don't need your shoulders always oh, up, no. back, and down. We've seen people like you're going to need an iron neck if you need that. <laughs> Iron neck, iron shoulders. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you know, there is also such a thing as standing up too tall. In dance, we work on, on standing really, really tall and, like, technically, f- you know, we use the term flattening out as many of your curves, ver- um, spinal curves as possible. And uh, with classical dance, we actually do see some neck issues at times or, or rib issues because of the flattening. Yeah. Through the thoracic, I've experienced that, and I've seen that in multiple dancers I've worked with. Well, and also I've seen advertised the like posture corrector, mm-hmm. which is just like the thing that goes across here, and it keeps you super rigid and great posture all the time. R- you hit the nail on the head with the word, though. Rigid. We rigid. just don't want anything rigid, so you don't need to stand with your shoulders up, back, and down. That's not perfect posture. That is going to hurt. Yeah, and yeah. it's going to weaken all those tissues around that area. Yeah. So not a great idea. Again, yeah. if you see a thing, you're like, wow, I didn't know I needed that, but now maybe I'll try that. It's just going to make things worse. <laughs> Got to have the heads up on that. In any case, guys, I think we should wrap this guy up. So do we have any closing remarks? Head Bro- on a swivel out there, people. Head on, Head a, on a swivel. swivel. Head on a swivel. It's true. Everything's coming for your wallet. <laughs> The fitness industry is very full of people who are very good at taking advantage of others. That is actually very true. And the ones with the financial backing are the ones who unfortunately get the biggest spotlight and the biggest microphone. So critical thinking is where it's at and uh, don't make any impulse purchases. (laughs) Think it through, contact a professional and you'll keep your head above water. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think just to give yourself time. There are, um, to end on a lighter note, there are a lot of really incredible people in this industry and we know them. And uh, not all of them, obviously. <laughs> but we know a lot of them. And we know people running their own their own companies, their own studios. Uh, they all have very clear visions in mind in terms of helping people regain health and regain healthy relationships with their bodies. Or, you know, some of them are more in high performance, others not. And so there, there's a lot of there are signals amongst the noise, mm -hmm. and you know there is a lot of noise too. To you, this is not my. Um, analogy, but I love it. It's from Stu Phillips uh, at, McMa at McMaster University. And, um, and so if anything's tapping into your fear or into a complex you have about yourself, uh, which can go hand in hand with fear, then, you know, step back and, and look at the source. Is that a person you personally know on a professional basis, not just a friend who followed a diet and you think that's good? Um, because there, there are a lot of signals. You generally, I'm not sure how many of them you'll see on socials because of the algorithms out there. I don't know. But if anything's tapping into a complex or a fear or showing you extremes, you know, you're probably better off not reading that content, not exposing yourself to that. Look to the people who are more ambiguous in some ways, and and you, you actually are are better off. But uh, head on a swivel, and yeah. I, I was just thinking, if if someone's trying to actively sell you something in this industry, yeah. it's probably not a good idea. Yeah. But if people are giving you information and letting you make the decision, it's probably a better avenue to go through. Yep. That's a great filter. Yep. Amazing. Sweet. All right, Roche. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad we could do this little roundtable discussion. And uh, maybe Thanks we'll have you back another time. Thanks. Thanks for letting me somewhat topic, talk into the mic and somewhat miss talking. Hey, man, into you the got mic. in there. You <laughs> got it. it. Look at you. You're so close. I know. I figured it out right. at the end. Of all right. The warmed up. Warmed yeah. up. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all we got for you today. Tune in next time to the Move Daily Health podcast. And we'll see you then. We hope you enjoyed our conversation. To hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Move Daily Health Podcast. And don't hesitate to leave us a review. Thanks for listening. <laughs>